Ya. Ya, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning ladies and gentlemen and all students. <clears throat> the theme of the lecture today is a medical system uh, as cultural system. Uh, thank ya, you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you very much for uh, Good morning Nadia. ladies and gentlemen and all students. <clears throat> the theme of the lecture today is a medical system uh, as cultural system. Uh, thank ya, you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much for uh, Professor Madia Dr. Nur Azlan bin Muhammad Nur, who has agreed to the be uh, guest lecture today. <clears throat> Please, Prof. Uh, Madia Dr. Azlan, to present uh, presentation. <clears throat> uh, 60 minutes. Yeah, 60 minutes and 20, uh, 30 minutes there will be question and answer. <clears throat> okay, insyaallah. <clears throat> boleh mulai, ya? boleh mulai. Okay, bro. Let's start, bro. Okay, yang gitu. Okay, izinkan saya untuk share ini apa itu um, slide saya ini. Bagaimana caranya ya? Um, bagaimana sharenya? Saya saya kurang arif ini. Saya nak share itu. Tombol hijau di hijau, green, and center. Sekejap. Sekejap. Okay. Ya, sekejap. sekejap. Nah, ya. Okay. Okay. Hijau, share screen dia. Tekan... Okay. Tekan share itu. Share hijau, ya. Yeah. Okey, hmm, okey, baik-baik. Okey, sudah sudah nampak ya? Sudah? Sudah, sudah, bro. Okey. Okey, okay, ya, bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah, bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, wabillahalamin. Wa salatu wa salamu ala asrafil anbiya wa mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Thank you. Terima kasih. And good morning to my audience. Ibu-ibu, bapa-bapa, prof dan dosen-dosen dan juga students of University of Universitas Pajaran Bandung, Indonesia. And to be more specific students from Studi Anthropology, Fakultas Limu Sosial, dan ilmu politik Universiti Pajaran Bandung Indonesia. At the time also, uh, head department Dr. Junadi Harhab for, uh, for, for, for being with us today. And first and foremost, uh, praise to Allah SWT and Barakah showered upon, showered upon us on this special program. May Allah bless us all. I would like to take this great opportunity uh, to congratulate Dr. Junadi as a head department and Dr. Inaw Herwati and the Granzing Committee for organizing this Dosen Tamu or Iwata Lecture Program. Shukran Jazilan. So Alhamdulillah, so please bear with me because uh, I have, I'm having sore throat and uh, a bit of flu. So by inshallah, I can shall I try my very best uh, to, to deliver my lecture today on entitled Medical Systems as Culture Systems. And the content of my presentation today, this morning, will cover medical system, culture system, healthcare system, ethnographic description of illness, influence and lessons to be learned, causation of disease, and conclusion. Let's move to the uh, the first slide. Uh, looking at the title, uh, so we have two main issues to discuss. One is uh, the meaning of uh, medical system. Second, it will be the meaning of cultural system. Of course, in my previous lecture, I did mention the definition of medical system, but this time around, I'm going to explore further of this particular concept. So what is a medical system? So a medical system is every medical system has its own uh, structured system. And this includes 
body of ideas, uh, values, practices embedded within the given medical system. So it's an ordered, coherent body of ideas, values, and practices embedded in a given cultural, cultural context from which it derives its signification. So meaning that it uh, medicine like traditional Malay medicine, Chinese medicine, uh, or, or the Orang Asli medicine, or the Iban medicine, plus the Ayurveda and Indian medicine, and of course, modern and Western medicine, they do have a structured system. And, uh, and in this case, when we look at the, uh, the medical system or all the medical system, what would be our observation? Our observation here is every medical system is about dealing with different systems of medical knowledge. So that is our observation. That means we are talking about dealing with different systems of medical knowledge. This is uh, important or this is uh, significant, particularly when we address issues like health, illness, disease and healthcare. So, the, uh, for example, in the case of uh, in religious dimension, uh, spirituality uh, could be the highest definition of good health. So, how we go about addressing the issues of health? How do we go about addressing the issues of illness? And how do we go about addressing the issues of disease and healthcare? Of course, uh, uh, every system has its own reasoning. We always talk about scientific reasoning, cultural reasoning and religious reasoning in, in any medical system. So in the case of religion, we will talk about from the religious point of view, spirituality could be the highest definition of good health. The concept of fear God, taqwa, and many more. This is true in the context of patients suffering from cancer or other chronic diseases, where I wish to them uh, good health means something to do with their spiritual dimension. Okay, because when they got cancer, for example, they are, even though they go for medication, they go to every system, every medical system, but the main point to them, good health, it means equivalent to spiritual, spiritual, spiritual good health. So in other words, the science of knowing in different premises. So in other words, we cannot deny the importance of us to know the biomedical framework versus sociocultural framework. That would be my understanding of medical system. Okay. And second, what do what do we mean by cultural system? Cultural system here in this case, we are talking about uh, about what? Actually. So I wish to refer how we go about understanding or defining cultural system. So what will be our understanding of the concept. So I wish to refer this to Clifford Geertz, a definition of Clifford Geertz, understanding of culture system. According to Clifford Geertz in his book entitled, The Interpretation of Culture suggests that culture system can best be understood in terms of their capacity to express the nature of the world and to shape the world to their dimensions. Thus, this simultaneous shaping and expression produces a congruence between culture and experience that provides an aura of factuality within which causal system makes sense and seem uniquely real to their participant. So the implications of Geert's analysis is that culture system achieve a feeling of factuality, of realness that is in part or whole a byproduct of their symbolic form. So the key word here is about aura of factuality. How, how do we go about understanding of aura of factuality in various medical systems? Of course, in certain medical system, maybe to us, it sounds not real, okay? But to the other system, it sounds to be real. So the issue here is about understanding the concept of factual, factuality. So in the modern medicine or in the, in the Western medicine, or in the Western medical system. Facts to them is facts that related to science. So you're, talk, you're talking about empirical facts versus facts in a cultural setting. 
So other medical system, maybe they don't talk about empirical knowledge. They talk about something beyond that. It can be a cultural dimension. It can be religious dimension of which at a certain point in a Western or in a biomedical framework, they will not, they will, this particular dimension will be marginalized. But in the case of uh, the other traditional system, like Malay traditional system, Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, and so on, they do have the scientific reasoning, but the scientific reasoning is, is, um, is being um, rephrased in such a way that the, uh, the, the religious dimension and cultural dimension can be part of the reasoning, the understanding health, illness, disease, and healthcare. So having said this, okay, having said all this, we can conclude that. So by looking at, through my explanation just now, having said all this, we can conclude that a comparative sense of health, illness, disease, and healthcare must compare ethno-medical and biomedical frameworks. We should be able to explore and compare ethno-medical and biomedical frameworks. Both ethno-medical and biomedical frameworks explore the determinants, forms, and consequences of medical beliefs held by patient, practitioner, and researcher like us as a medical anthropologist. So in other words, we are talking about science of knowing, science of knowing adopted by a biomedical framework and science of knowing adopted by ethno-medical framework. Or you can say uh, some kind of cross-cultural study on the medical system. This is to show how illness is socially constructed in the every context of popular care, in the professional context of biomedical practice and in folk healing system. In other words, when we do uh, make a study, a comparative study and cross-cultural study of every medical system in the society, and the, the rationale for it is to show how illness and disease are socially constructed in, in the popular care, in the professional context, or in the folk healing system. So this helps us in making comparison or making analysis between lay men illness experiences and to what extent that experiences or perspectives are in conflict or in contrast with the medical model social construction of disease. So in other words, when we do this comparative or cross-cultural study of the medical system, we are able to compare, we can, we can make a comparative analysis between layman understanding of illness, layman understanding of disease, and to, to, uh, and to see to what extent uh, the layman experiences or perspective are in conflict or, or in contrast, or in other words, it can be in parallel with the model, with the medical model, social construction of disease. Meaning here, we have two issues. One is about social construction of illness. Two is about social construction of disease. This is the, I could say, uh, important facts that we need to understand when we explore or when we study or when we make, when we make comparative study <coughs> of the medical system in the society. <laughs> And, and this brings me to explore further, of course, this, uh, this diagram or this figure, I already had presented in my first lecture, but I'm going to bring back this, this, uh, this figure again to show uh, what kind of healthcare system that we have. So, so far, when we talk about healthcare system, most healthcare system, uh, most healthcare system comprises or contain three social arenas within which sickness is experienced and reacted to. When we look at the, uh, the diagram here, we can see there are three important sectors here. One is popular sector down below here, if I could show you here, okay, popular sector. This is popular sector. And this popular sector can be individual based, can be family based, <coughs> can be social nexus based, <coughs> and can be community based. <laughs> Sorry. So in other words, popular sector means individual sector, individual based can be like self-medication. Family based can be a family, family support uh, to, the, uh, uh, to, to strengthen our views or perspective of 
healthiness. Okay, and then we have this uh, social nexus, social social uh, networking. That means we have community members to come in uh, to talk or to show or to to share uh, their uh, health and illness experience in the community. And also we do have the, the community base. And uh, we, when we look at this, uh, the second sector, we had the folk sector. And this folk sector talk about non-professional healing specialists. And of course, I did mention in my previous lecture, this includes the Pak Dukun and also the Bomo, or maybe among the Orang Asti, they say they call it Halak, or, the, or, in, or in English we call it traditional healers. And this, uh, I could say, non-professional healing specialists are, are well accepted in the community for those who adopt uh, traditional medicine. And, and lastly, you have the third sector where you have the professional sectors. And these professional sectors consist of professional specialists, or professional scientific specialists that includes the Western medicine and cosmopolitan cosmopolitan medicine or the modern medical specialists, and professional and professionalized indigenous healing tradition like chiropractor. We have this uh, Chinese Chinese uh, medicine like acupuncture. We have this Ayurvedic uh, traditional healer. All these are considered as pro can be lumped into professional sector. And those three uh, factors okay, help us to construct uh, to construct the, the real the social reality. And uh, that is the reality that we have in the community. These are the medical systems that we always uh, or that we always seek for when it comes to addressing issues of health illness and disease. And uh, the, of course, they have a different jurisdiction, jurisdiction for, for each medical system here, yeah? whether you're talking about medical, we are talking about in the professional sector or in the folk sector or in the, in the popular sector, they do have their own jurisdiction. They have their own aura of factuality. If I could use the Clifford Gears term, the aura of factuality. Of course, in the case of professional sector, particularly in the modern medical system, the hour of fertility will be based on scientific reasoning. To them, these are facts about health, these are facts about disease, and these are facts about healthcare, and these are the facts about illness. But in the case of folk sector and popular sector, maybe they go for another reasoning. And of course, they do accept the scientific reasoning, but at the same time, the cultural reasoning and the religious reasoning supersedes the cult, the scientific reasoning. That means that will be the priority in, in addressing issues about health, illness, healthcare, and disease within their own, within, within their, their respective se sector. So how, now the issue here is, we want to understand about medical system as culture system. How do we go about with this? So let's begin our topic on medical system as culture system with ethnographic, with, with ethnographic description of illness. That means the, this medical ethnographic description describes the therapeutic communication, uh, therapeutic communicating that is taking place in the medical system. And at this particular point, as medical anthropologists, we wish to show how illness is socially and culturally constructed in quite distinct ways in the everyday context of popular care or in the professional context of bio biomedical practice and also in the folk healing system. So this is the issue here. We are going to bring in some of the ethnographic description of illness, some of the cases of which we can see how, how it goes. Let's look at case study number one. This is a case study, uh, sorry of all the text, but I. I use the red color to highlight some of the important points so that you don't have to read all the details. Okay, you can just read the uh, everything highlighted in red, in red, sorry. So this study, uh, or this case was adopted from Lederman, uh, study uh, Lederman's fieldwork in Malaysia. And, and, and according to Lederman, so rural Malays, like many past and contemporary peoples, believe in an orderly universe 
composed of the four elements. So among the Malays, rural Malays or urban Malays, we do believe in these four major elements, earth, air, fire and water. And these elements must be in balance. So the primary disease etiology is based on the hot and cold dichotomy, the hot and cold intrinsic qualities. So that means they talk about in Malay, panas and suju, dimension. When we talk about health, okay? And they talk about the, uh, the four elements of the universe. We talk about the earth, the air, fire, and water. And of course, in Malay, we say tanah, air, api, dan angin. Okay? So that will be the Malay's understanding about the universe. At the same time, this, uh, these elements must be in balance. Okay? Anything goes wrong, any element which is not is not in balance, then they create more. They can have, they can affect the the health status of the people in the society. So, ordinary fevers, respiratory ailments, or digestive upsets are believed to result from a humoral imbalance, either to the hot or the cold polarity. In other words, in the Malay culture, when they talk about human body, they don't they will understand. In the case, you know, in the human body, we do have another element. We have this water, we have air, we have blood, and we have phlegm. So when we talk about universe, they talk about earth, air, fire, and water. But when we talk about human body, they talk about water, air, blood, and phlegm. These elements must be in balance. These are, these are called humoral elements in the body. So muscular pain are believed to be caused by lumps of phlegm, of which blocking the flow of blood. Okay? The blood in our body will be classified as a hot humor. The phlegm will be classified as a cold humor. So they are treated by massage, which breaks up the clots of phlegm and allows the hot blood to flow unobstructed through the muscle. So they believe the muscle, the muscle pains uh, the muscle pain suffered by the by the patient are very much related to these four humor four humors. And of course, the, the treatment given will be massage. And the muscle is to break down, to break the clots of phlegm. But should uh, ordinary health problems not respond to this treatment? Let's say after going through all this treatment, it is not successful. So the Malays believe uh, illness appears to be unusual in kind or in cost. So a suspicion may arise that spirits have been sent by an ill worship. So that is now they believe about something beyond the four elements. They believe now there's another kind of uh, supernatural forces coming into the body. So they need, and here they will employ Bomo or the Padukon to counteract the spirit's hot breath with their own made coal by an incantation. So they start giving all the uh, cold ingredients to treat the hot elements. So, but if should the patient not improve, then they go even further to hold a seance, uh, a seance named mind putty. So, mind putty is a traditional Malay seance that includes the patients or patients, the shaman, the mindok, the interpreter or master of the spirits, and a small group of musicians as well as an audience. So the main putri is another kind of treatment and is available in, uh, in the traditional Malay medical system. So the issue here is the cultural beliefs play a, a significant role in understanding the health and the inner status of a patient. Then this will be case one. Case two, I wish to bring in another ethnographic description of illness. This case two, Case studies too is quite interesting. This case two study is a study done by by Kleiman, Arthur Kleiman, uh, based on his fieldwork in Taiwan. Okay. So this case uh, was taken from Kleiman's fieldwork in Taiwan, and the um, the case study is about what? So in this case study, Kleiman showed to us about four different explanatory models. So we have the uh, shaman explanation, you have the mother's explanation, you have the patient's explanation, and you have also the practitioner's explanation. So, I mean, 
how how this uh, exploratory model play an important role and helps the uh, the uh, the, trad- the the healers respective whether modern or traditional healers whether they're talking about biomedical frameworks or the social cultural frameworks okay but they how they go about again understanding this uh, concept of health in this disease and healthcare that in this case uh, tongue keys or shaman explanation this is one of the explanatory model uh, given by by the shaman so from the shaman's point of view so this is the uh, the free notes taken by climbing according to him an elderly lady and her 22 year old son have just arrived for a consultation the tanki or the shaman does not name the problem according to the tanki the elderly lady and her son sickness was caused by the ghost by the ghost of a girl who died unmarried and who is now haunting him so the the shaman advice the shaman advises the mother uh, to make some kind of charms and to to burn uh, a large amount of spirit money so to deal with this ghost matter okay ghost of a girl who died unmarried and when who is now haunting him so the options given or the uh, the prescription given by the shaman is to hold a kind of um, a kind of ritual perhaps to burn a large amount of the spirit money okay this is coming from um from a shaman talking about the uh, the inner suffered by this 22 year old son and then and then there's another explanation model given by the mother of course the uh, the explanation model by the the mother's patient will be entirely different from the shaman of course of the same case but the mother speaking to the people in the shrine in general recounts the son's problem in a deeply troubled voice according to her his inner his son inner began at age 7 after he was hit on the head with a hammer by an older brother since then uh, his son did badly in school and dropped out of the middle school before graduation at the same time his her son suffered from bleeding gastric ulcer and other problems dreaming too much and frequent nocturnal emission and also the mother explained about her son illness okay uh, and the last she blames that as a real cause of his present condition since the semen loss makes him lose young uh, young male principle this is called yin and yang concept among the chinese they have another principle talking about human balance we're talking about the yin and yang uh, or hot and cold dichotomy so according to the mother the mother and the mother explanation is totally different from the tanki so you have two expert model about the same sickness and then you look at the patient's explanation this is coming from another uh, another expert model expert, expert model but this expert model is coming from the patient's perspective according to this patient uh, he tells us that recently he has suffered from stiffness and tenseness in his neck long along with insomnia he had chronic ulcer problem and he admits to feeling anxious and of course the patient reports contact with numerous western star doctors and also uh, keep in touch with chinese star doctor for his health problem so in other words patients uh, by by looking at his expertise model he believe he suffered from some kind of insomnia he suffered chronic ulcer problem he uh, he feels anxious right anxiety and because of that he went to see the shaman the traditional healer at the same time he also went to see the doctor the western star doctors at the same time he went to offer himself for uh, for chinese medicine a chinese star doctor for his health problem but the result will be none of this have worked so none of the uh, i could say the treatment sought by the uh, patient uh, really solved the problem and then we go down again uh, this is quite lengthy okay because this is another expert model sorry for because uh, too many texts 
uh, for my slide. So in this, we talk about uh, coming from the practitioners. Uh, practitioners mean coming from the Western style doctors, coming from the Chinese style doctors, and coming from the Taiwanese psychiatrists. So from here, the Western style doctors, the patient and his mother consulted, told them he was suffering from neurasthenia. Uh, so that means, uh, in other words, uh, kind of uh, 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 the Chinese style doctor uh, told them that the problem faced by his son was a broken kidney. So weak kidney function or kidney deficiency, uh, which the patient and his mother also took to mean a physical disorder. So that means uh, the Western star doctors and Chinese star doctor, they have another uh, different diagnosis compared to Tan Ki's explanation. So we have Western style diagnosis, which diagnose uh, this, uh, this 22-year-old uh, son suffered from neurasthenia. And the Chinese style doctor diagnosed that uh, this son uh, suffered from uh, weak kidney function or broken kidney. But the Taiwanese psychiatrist, they have another, uh, another, another observation. The Taiwanese psychiatrist learned from the patient that he engaged in frequent masturbation, which troubled him greatly because of his fear that he was losing semen, representing irreplaceable qi. So a combination, you see, the, the Chinese cultural belief about the concept of qi. The concept of qi is more like uh, the vital essence or the vital force in the body and the losing of yang, uh, the losing of the hot and cold dichotomy. He believed that, the, time, the psychiatrist believed that, now this, this, the, the, um, uh, the patient believed that masturbation was dangerous to his health and was the cause of his problem. So it, this made him feel guilty and frustrated because he felt himself unable to stop masturbating and consequently felt condemned to suffer the various symptoms he had. So in other words, this, uh, you can, uh, so what is the issue here? Okay, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to read the, uh, the details or the whole description, but from these four expertry models of the same sickness, uh, the, the diagnosis given by the tanki or the shaman, the, the diagnosis or the expertry model uh, given by, by the mother, okay, and the, the expertry model given by the patient, okay, and the expertry model given by the practitioners. And we have these Western star doctors, the Chinese star doctors, and the Taiwanese psychiatrists. So from the four, four different expertry models, what, 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 what lessons that we can learn from here? So we see, okay, we, we, what, what, what kind of inference that we can make from this particular, particular more expertise model. The, the case illustration, I mean, I one, two, three, four. Okay, the case illustration discloses the plural cognitive structures, okay, at play in most healthcare transactions. So in other words, when we, when we look at the four expression model, it shows to us it's a plural <coughs> cognitive structures at play in most healthcare transactions. The healthcare transactions observed in these expression models held by patients, held by mother, and held by uh, health practitioners, and held by, medic by, by the uh, by, uh, by the tanki, by the patient, by the shaman, shows that their content frequently uh, or strictly or uh, frequently different or in conflict from the biomedical concepts. See, uh, so that means the expiratory model of practitioners, if you look at the expiratory model of the practitioners, tend to come into two distinct versions. One is a professional scientific level of discourse. Two will be the communication with patients in a clinic discourse. And when we talk about communication in a clinic setting, so we, can, we will encounter the toxic knowledge okay, between the patients and the healer or between the patients and the, uh, uh, the practitioner. We can see just now, if you look at, uh, let me go back to the uh, practitioner here. So the Taiwan psychiatrist, 
So the Taiwan psychiatry learned from the patient that he engaged in frequent masturbation. Okay, because of his fear and he was losing semen representing irreplaceable chi. So that means when there's a clinic, uh, when, when there's a what they call is a, a clinic, a communication uh, took place in the clinic. So you can see that the communicate that uh, communication with the patient in a clinic in a clinic, the uh, the, uh, the the practitioner uh, will be able to explore uh, the the toxic knowledge within the patient, right? And um, yeah, so and then uh, we can see just now from the description given, we can see that explanatory model can be analyzed along five central issues they generally cover. They cover about the, uh, what we call this, the uh, etiology. You can see how the um, the patients and how the uh, uh, the four explanatory model uh, will, will provide us, provide us with four different diagnoses, okay? You, of the same sickness. So explanatory model can be analyzed by looking at the etiology of the sickness or the etiology of the illness. And number two, we can also look at the onset of symptom. There are different symptoms, uh, different kind of analysis. So maybe in the case of uh, shaman, uh, he talk about the uh, about the. Uh, uh, if you look at this, we talk about uh, the uh, the sickness. The, the her son's sickness was caused by the ghost, and of course, okay. And the only options to treat for this matter will be by burning a large amount of spirit money. So, so that means you talk about something supernatural and uh, the treatment will be very much related to for supernatural causes. And then you talk about it, the symptoms uh, given by the mother, right? Uh, and you talk also symptoms given by uh, the patient and also symptoms uh, uh, given by the, uh, by the practitioners. So in other words, we can look at the onset of the symptom, pathophysiology processes associated with disease and the cause of sickness, whether it is severe or it is mild. So we can talk about the degree of severity, severity of the sick, of the sickness or the disease. And we talk, we can also talk, we can also look at the sick role or the role played by the patient, right? You can see that patients are adopting this medical pluralistic attitude as far as treatment is concerned. So that means patients are not, uh, in this case, patient is not focusing uh, to one particular medical system. Okay, based on their cultural beliefs, based on their religious belief, perhaps based on their scientific beliefs. So the patients uh, try very much to seek more than one medical system. And the only, the only reason for the medical pluralistic, pluralistic attitude is to search for a cure. That's it, nothing much. Okay. And then, um, what lessons that we can learn from this, uh, from this uh, observation, okay, by looking at this uh, uh, model and that by looking at the different sectors, the professional sectors, the folk healing sectors, and the popular sector, what? Lessons to but what, what kind of lessons that we can learn from this? There are four things that we can see here from based on from, us, from the slide given just now. Comparative studies of systems of medical knowledge disclose repeatedly and in great detail that sickness is socially constructed. Okay, the key word here is whether you talk about illness, whether you talk about illness, we talk about disease, sickness is socially constructed when you do a comparative study of systems of the medical knowledge okay remember in my the first slide i did mention when we talk about medical system regardless whether you're talking about modern medicine or uh, which uh, subscribe to more to biomedical framework or maybe you talk about that is traditional medical system where you subscribe more to beliefs cultural beliefs or religious belief okay they do have different systems of medical knowledge. That would be the observation. So from our observation, from the discussion based on the ethnographic medical description just now, we can see sickness is 
socially constructed. Number two, uh, another lesson that we can learn, comparisons of medical knowledge, I'm talking about medical knowledge for every system then, reveal that an accurate picture of clinical reality requires both biomedical and ethnomedical perspectives. Meaning that by looking at the medical knowledge in each of the system, we are able to review, we are able to disclose the fact that we are able to disclose the, the and we are able to disclose an accurate picture of a clinical reality. The reality is we need both biomedical and ethnomedical perspective into play. Okay, we are, that means when we talk about uh, efficacy of the treatment, we talk about the u the utilization of the uh, both biomedical perspective and ethnomedical perspective. Compare and the third point comparisons of <coughs> different system of medical knowledge teach us that those systems of medical knowledge exert a large effect on evaluations of therapeutic efficacy. That means when we talk about efficacy of the treatment. So we need to have knowledge, uh, we need to have this, uh, all the medical knowledge from different medical sectors. What is defined in biomedicine as therapeutic efficacy appears to relate largely and frequently only to disease. So what is wrong here? No, not to say wrong, uh, is something that quite misleading here. When we talk about what is defined in biomedicine to them, well, uh, therapeutic efficacy in the context of biomedicine is only talking about tre treating the disease. But in reality, we are, not, we are not talking about treating disease alone. Okay, So we need to reconceptualize the healing process. Healing is not about curing the disease. Okay, Healing means you need to look at it in a, in a holistic manner. It covers healing of illness and also curing of disease. So in other words, we need the uh, both biomedical and ethnomedical to merge okay, for a better or uh, for a better therapeutic better understanding of uh, therapeutic efficacy. And finally, lessons that we can learn. The resolutions for the case will require the ethnomedical as well as the biomedical perspective. Neither alone is sufficient. That means uh, none of the frameworks regardless whether you talk about ethnomedical and biomedical frameworks, they cannot stand alone in understanding health, illness, disease, and healthcare. So the medical system that we, that we, are, we are doing now, we are, we are treating all the medical system that needs to be, to, be, to be looked as a holistic manner because none of the medical system can stand alone. When we talk about therapeutic efficacy, or when we talk about healing of illness or curing of disease. These are the lessons that we can learn from the cases uh, described above. Okay, then the, let's look at the, um, so now we can we, so based on this, based on the description given just now, based on the ethnographic medical description given, so now we can go a little bit details, causation of disease. So when you talk about causation of disease, how do we go about how do we go about understanding the cause of disease? According to Rivers, yeah, in the, uh, according to uh, Rivers, uh, W. H. R. Rivers in in in, in his book, uh, published in 1924, entitled Maxson, Magic and Religion. So Causes of disease may be grouped in three different classes. Okay, three different classes. What are those? Number one, we talk about human agency. What is human agency? Human agency here meaning uh, we are talking about in which it is believed that disease is directly due to action on the part of some human beings. We're talking about there's a role of human here. Uh, and which uh, they believe that disease is directly due to the action on the part of uh, is maybe it's a part of your your action is your behavior okay that means as a human 
and because of you, you because of you, or because of your behavior, you uh, you un, you end up suffering a certain kind of disease. For example, lifestyles, right? And that is partly of our behavior. The second uh, the second category will be spiritual or supernatural being or action of some agent who is not human. And this is again disease according to reverse can be caused by by non-human. We have this some kind of supernatural being or supernatural forces involved okay, beyond us, beyond of our behavior. And uh, this uh, can be part of related to witchcraft or sorcery. And this is beyond, beyond of human agency. This is coming something which is not human. And the third point and the third category, what we ordinarily call natural causes. Okay, natural causes mean you're talking about, uh, let's say, falling from a tree, okay, accident, all these are natural causes. So when we look at the three different categories here, yeah, the second category still exists in the hands of God. So that means point number one is about human, point number three is about nature, point number two, there is some kind of intervention uh, in the comma. I'm not saying. I'm not saying direct, but I'm just saying uh, kind of, uh, there's a kind of intervention from, uh, from the super, from supernatural power beyond us, the almighty God. Okay. So in the professional uh, art of medicine and, um, with, and in the professional medicine or in a, we talk about in others, in, in professional sector or folk healing sector and so on, the, um, the, as, as in the case of natural causes, the causes, the causation of disease can be, in a, can be in response to changes in our environment. That means for natural causes, we can talk about interaction between you within the environment. And the, the causes can be, can be different depending on if there is any changes in the environment. Okay, and these three causes, can be further explained in the, in the next slide. Okay, let me show you this. Okay, from this, uh, oh, hang on, where, where am I now? Okay, so from this uh, three uh, classification of disease, which I already mentioned just now. So we, we, can, we can now understand uh, there's a new concept involved here. That means you're not talking about something to, to do with scientific arguments about disease. There will be argument about magic. There is a, an argument about religion as far as causation of disease is concerned. The causation of disease by human and the causation of disease by non-human agency. So now, until, until at this point, right, the, issue, the main issues and questions will be, will be what? will be how we go about treating our subject matter. So our subject matter, in the case of health, illness, disease, and healthcare, can be lumped into three different categories. Can be in the forms of medicine, the medicine that we used to understand, medicine, the modern medicine, or we can lump them into uh, in the category of magic. It's also part of how we go about understanding Inner health and disease, magic, the role of magic, and also the role of religion as a causation of disease. And based on this uh, new concept, Rivers in his book entitled Medicine, Magic, Religion has classified the disease into three different categories, of which we can also look this matter uh, from, a different, uh, from a different frameworks. Number one is those in which some morbific object or substance is projected into the body of the victim. We are they're talking about something that is that's threatening to the body, that can bring more harm to the body. Okay, morbific object, certain object that can create more harm to the body. That will be the first category of disease. We will, I will give examples to this. Number two, those in which something is abstracted from the body. I mean, abstracted from the body means it can be 
something within yourself, right? So, one, we talk about the body as a physical body. Two, we are talking about the uh, certain certain forces, certain elements within the body that can be abstracted from the body. And the third category of disease, those in which the sorcerer or the witchcraft acts on some part of the body of a person or on some object which has been connected with the body of a person. And they believe that they buy, he can act on the person as a whole. That means the witchcraft or the sorcerer can uh, can do, can, can, uh, what say, can, based on his or her knowledge, can do, can create more harm to the body. Okay, I will give examples so that you will be able to understand better about this, the three categories of disease. Let's uh, discuss about this one by one. Okay, okay, we, okay. Those the first category just now, we already mentioned just now, those in which some morbific object or substance is projected into the body of the victim. That means uh, there are certain things that, could, that can create more harm or is a threat to the body, to the human body. Example, poisoning and sorcery, santau makan or santau angin. I would like to take this uh, Example from a study done by Michael Pallas in the Milan, uh, Malaysia. Okay, so this is a study done by uh, Michael Pallas in Malaysia and, and based on his article, Poisoning, Sorcery and Healing Rituals in the Milan. So what, what it's all about? It's about Santau. Nergis Milan Malays believe that poisoning or Santau and sorcery or Sihil can be affected through a variety of conventional procedures, only some of which require a high degree of esoteric knowledge and skills associated with black magic or black arts. And, and the procedures will be, the, the sorcerer will use certain spells uh, and special village medicines that can be, you know, can be used for the case of poisoning. And they, the sorcerer will prepare uh, the uh, powdered glass, the suburb culture, together with bamboo slivers and other dangerous irritants. And this substance will be kept hidden under the culprit's fingernails until such time as he or she is ready to introduce them with a flick of fingers into the targeted individual's food or drink. So that means it's called Santa. So the sorcerer will prepare and the, uh, the, uh, the, or the, the prepared, uh, the prepared ingredients will be, you know, will be prepared, will be kept under the carpet fingernails. Of course, the sorcerer will, will cut certain spells over the, over the, over the ingredients before, before it can, before it takes place. Santau makan, poisoning through food, and the effects of it, the patients, the or the victims will suffer coughing, spitting of blood, loss of appetite. And wait, and uh, and the worst part will be death. But that is one kind of poisoning. Okay, so, uh, but but this poisoning methods can also be done, can be achieved through sorcery from a considerable distance. And this is known as santau angin. Okay, where the, this is most commonly affected by hiring a ritual specialist to create or harness malevolent winds or currents which are then sent in the direction of the targeted individual who is hope will inhale them. So this can be done too. So one is through food and the other one is through wind uh, from a distance. Uh, the only thing according to Michael Pallets, uh, the Malays will, uh, will what God is will, uh, Invite the 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 ritual specialist to hold a ceremony. Uh, the ritual specialist will, will cut the spells, and the spells will be used to to send whatever ingredients uh, to the to the targeted individual, hoping that the the victims will inhale 
to the kadar we all right so the so in other words the the patients or the victims will suffer the same uh, symptoms okay coughing spitting of blood and possibly death okay this is the first uh, category which i mentioned to you just now this no, sorry uh, right those in which some morphic object object that create more harm to the body or substance is projected into the body or the victim all right so cases as a, as a example here uh, based on a study by michael pellets about poisoning and sorcery santau can see here the second uh, the second classification of disease uh, mentioned by uh, by rivers will be those in which something is abstracted from the body that means you can control certain elements in the body what are the things we can talk about here the concept of the malay concept of semangat or vital force or the malay or the, the malay concept of body the evil spirit the evil spirit uh, emanating from the dead body body okay for this case for this category i would like to take another case a study done by carol dadman anthropologist by the name of dadman and she did her study in trengganu malaysia okay so what do you what kind of observation made by carol dadman here so body is a name given to the evil principle which according to the view of malay medicine attends like an evil angel everything that has life including trees stones and minerals according to aladdin the body of human corpses can be extremely dangerous to the unborn to infants whose semangat or uh, whose vital force has not yet become strong and to people whose semangat has been weakened so according to aladdin right when we talk about this case, second category abstraction from the body one good example to talk about this is about the um, in our body among the malays we do believe of the concept of semangat maybe in a in a modern terms um, but it is not that close to to the definition we used to say the word motivation right you are motivated you are demotivated even though it is not that close to the concept of semangat because semangat is not about motivation is uh, the meaning of the concept means much more than that so it's a malay culture belief so you have some kind of vital force for example let's say we talk let's say by gender right semangat of a man and semangat of a woman okay you can see a clear disparity semangat of a woman is much weaker compared to semangat of a man man seems to appears to be strong mature and able to deal with with um, with the uh, with the circumstances or maybe if you are in unforgiven circumstances the um, the uh, the semangat of a man can handle it but for semangat of women okay uh, is much more vulnerable so they are they are not as strong as a man so as far as integrity is concerned uh, the integrity is much more to men rather than to women So in this case, for older men, the young ones, the babies of the unborn child, the the semangat they have is still immature and not is still not strong, very weak. So for 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 any women, let's say if you are having a child in the womb or having a child or a baby in the in the in in the womb, you're not supposed to pay a visit to to visit to 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 a person. uh to to we or to, to see the human body human corpse or human corpse or you are not supposed to see the dead body so prospective parents and sick or delicate people may have unpleasant uh, after mass to a visit of consolation so the unborn child may be afflicted with body maya which manifests itself as a vesting disease the baby refuses what are the symptoms of body maya the baby refuses to eat and and takes on on the appearance of a corpse and dies within weeks 
of his birth. So this is a study done by Calderman in Terengganu, Malaysia. Okay, he observed the importance of semangat, particularly for the for the unborn baby or the unborn child. Okay, all right. So now it's already ten o'clock, Doctor Hajinadi. Before I can continue the third one, any so it's already one hour sixty minutes. Maybe uh, something to say, any questions to ask for the time being? I can. I can respond to that, inshallah. Yeah. Yeah. Before Thank you. Before Thank you very continue. much for explanation, uh, Professor Madia, Doctor Azlan. <clears throat> I hope uh, there will uh, be many questions. Uh, uh, the student will ask related the topic, uh, uh, the health uh, anthropology uh, this time, and uh, uh, they can become the topic of the scripty, uh, the topic of student. <clears throat> Please, the student. <clears throat> All the others, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you have a question. Or can you do in the make a question uh, directly or the via chat? Please, if you have question. <clears throat> Yeah, any, anybody would like to ask any questions? Kau tak ada, saya sambung lagi. Okay, bro. <laughs> okay, I will just continue. Maybe after this, you have questions, inshallah. Okay, then the, the third category. Okay, the third category. Okay, let me... Those in which the sorcerer acts on some part of the body of a person or on some object which has been connected with the body of a person in the belief that thereby he can act on the person as a whole. So this is totally different from the two types of diseases that we mentioned just now. Just now we talk about how the first we talk about how um, certain uh, what are called morbific, morbific object or something uh, items or that could create more harm to the body okay and then we talk about the the second part we talk about uh, the smanga and the body uh, we talk about how uh, certain things can be uh, abstracted from the body and finally the third one will be uh, those in which the sorcerer the role of the sorcerer acts on some part of the body of a person or some object which has been connected with the body. So in other words, here we talk about something to do, we can talk about contagious magic. Good example, let's say we talk about voodoo, right? You see in among the Africans, among the, uh, in uh, the tribal community in Africa, they can have a voodoo, they have a kind of, uh, they get to have an effigy, uh, okay? Uh, uh, just a kind of uh, wax-like figure, wax-like figure known as effigy of a person. And they make it such it looks like you, okay. But uh, then they start to use that effigy, uh, the wax like figure, and start to cast spells on it and uh, do something nasty on the on the effigy. Let's say if you use the needles and poke somewhere around the chest, automatically the person will be suffering chest pain. But you are doing on the on on the effigy. Not the other person itself, on the figure itself, created by you, right? Uh, this is a, this is examples of number three here, and the example give, I would like to give here is about hilang semangat, okay, losing of vital force and love magic. So how for this particular case, I'm going to refer uh, to a study done by by Andy Cott, right? This is um, a study by. K.M. Andicon in his book, An Analysis of Malay Magic. So issues of um, belief, issues on Malay, issue of Malay beliefs on semanga. Okay. Uh, so controlling, controlling the semangat is one of the aspects, okay, that we can figure out here. So that means, sorry. Okay, sorry. The control of the actions of things is only one aspect of the close interaction 
between the Sunanga and the body it, it occupies. Any strength or weakness or the Sunanga is transmitted to the body and vice versa. Okay, they are both weakened by illness, care or cavalry, and above all, by fear. So that means, what do, how do you explain about Sunanga? Sometimes among the Malays, they have a belief uh, choosing the right name, choosing the personal names is very much related to one's manga. Okay, you can see among the Malays those days, if they choose a certain name, they say name is Khatija. No, they say, they say Salma. And to, let's say you name after your baby by the name of Salma. That would be the personal name for the person, for the baby. And after a while, the baby keeps on crying, keeps on crying non-stop. And the Malays believe the name is not suitable for this baby. So they will bring, uh, the parents will bring the baby to see the midwives or the traditional healers and they get to choose another names. That's how you can see in a Malay village, the official name in your IC, in your identity card, is different from the name that you used to address him or her in the kampung. For example, in the case of Salma, the official name is Salma, but in the village, they call it Ambun. Okay? Because by calling Ambun, automatically, the baby stops crying. So that means the name Ambun, or the word Ambun, Ambun is suitable for, for his or her smangat. Okay? So smangat and, and the body is well connected. Okay? So, but they are both weakened by illness. So when you are suffering certain kinds of illness or disease, automatically, you become demotivated. You are losing your so-called hilang semangat. And what more if you, if a person involved in an accident, you're losing your semangat too, right? So you can see some of the Malays. Okay, I think uh, uh, it's quite common among the Malays in Malaysia and also in, in Indonesia. When they have a tragic events happening in your life, particularly accident, right? So car accident, whatever, or, uh, then the person will be suffering from some kind of healing smile. Okay, and then to treat that, so you have to see the uh, the Pak Dukun, and the Pak Dukun or the, the healers will do certain, certain kind of rituals to bring back your losing vital force to a normal vital force. From hilang semangat to semangat yang normal. Okay? So only when the semangat is weakened <coughs> and can the spirit enter the body and cause some disruption. So if the semangat, if your vital force is not that strong anymore, do certain factors. So you are allowing your body becomes vulnerable. Vulnerable for what? Vulnerable from from the spirit attack, okay? That means uh, the uh, the malevolent spirits can enter the body and create can create more things, more harm to the body, okay? So, so that there was, and, and not only about uh, allowing the spirits to come in, and once your body becomes vulnerable because of your, your weak smangat, so this allows the black magic to work on. Because the black magic will be able to extract the uh, the smangat of the people, okay, leaving the body out of control, and of course the result of the black magic can lead to madness, right? A symptom like loss of memory, uncertain speech, and failure to recognize even one's own parents. So madness from loss of smangat may lead to physical illness and eventually death, because the absence of smangat makes the body vulnerable to the entry of a spirit. I think all of us are aware. Where is the time where people would like to do uh, to, to cast spells on you? Okay, and normally they have to do it at night. Why they have to do it at night? Because when you sleep, when you lie down on the bed, okay, your smangat can be controlled by others. That's why in Islam you are supposed to recite du'a before you go to bed to protect the smangat from being taken away. From unnes from un un uh, from from irresponsible person uh, who has the ill feelings towards you, and of course the uh, ex and, and the common example we could say here the true love charm, right? Okay, they call it love magic. 
is quite common. So Endicott study based on Endicott's work, so he he said that black magic is one of the common things, uh, and it's quite popular among the Malays those days. When we talk about abduction of a person's mind, okay, you create a, a situation where the person from not loving you to loving you so much because of black black magic. Okay, okay. Then the next. Uh, so these are the three categories of diseases uh, mentioned by Rivers, and I'll give you the examples uh, to clarify the uh, to clarify the, your curiosity for these three categories. Okay, and okay. So at the end of the day, right when we talk about uh, medical anthropology. So what are we talking about here? So medical anthropology, in this case, is about what? So, so when we talk about medical anthropology, we are talking about uh, something to do with cultural conceptions. Okay? Cultural conceptions of what? Cultural conceptions about pain. How we do, how we go about understanding pain okay, from a cultural point of view. So there are three I could highlighted here. Uh, okay, highlighted here these at um, uh, these um, issues of at uh, this uh, okay sorry based on my uh, explanation of all the of the, the slide just now. So we need to understand that uh, medical anthropologists uh, seek to understand and to help others to, to see that help is rooted in cultural conceptions. So being a medical anthropologist, our duty now here is to help others to understand, to understand what, to understand health, inner disease and healthcare in a wider perspective, not in one particular framework. So as I already mentioned just now, we need to have the, the biomedical perspective and the social cultural perspective to be together. Or I could say, the ethnomedical description or ethnomedical framework and biomedical framework to be together, right? It, it, it can never stand alone. So we need we need to say that health is rooted in cultural conceptions. We can discuss about uh, pain and culture. In other words, when we talk about health, we talk about illness, we talk about disease, we talk about healthcare. All these are culturally constituted ways of experiencing pain. Okay, that would be number one. The second uh, point that we would like to mention here is how it's rooted in, so in social connections. Social connections mean we talk about type of relation within the family, type of relation within the members in the community, type of, uh, type of uh, relationship between in other political sectors, or in other sectors, politics, economy, religion, whatever. So medical anthropologists, uh, our duty here is to, to explore those concepts in a in a in a wider perspective in the case of social connection, and thirdly, okay, we can also say health is rooted in human biology. So we are talking about understanding threat of microscopic pathogens to bodily system, and we talk about the the uh, the pathogens. Uh, we can talk about the role of microbes. Yeah, we can talk about we can discuss about uh, something at the micro level. Okay. But at the same time, we can also talk about from the macro level. That means we can talk about the role of virus or the role of microbes, which, which, which we always classify as bacteria or viral infection. At the same time, we can also talk about certain things at the macro level, talking about the, uh, the awareness or health education that needs to be addressed uh, to, the, to the members of the community to understand the, uh, not just about their body, to understand how they reposition their body in the community. Of course, when you talk about your own body, you talk about something to do with micro level. Let's say, in my case now, I'm having throat, I'm having sore throat and flu. So I'm talking about some, maybe some, some kind of viral infection. That means I will be talking about my body as a body of which I need to handle at a micro level. So I need to go to see the doctor and to get, to get treated to get treatment. But at the same time, I need to understand my body at a macro level. So how I need to reposition myself 
since I'm having flu, I have a sore throat. Okay, I got a, so for fear of uh, something to do with COVID-19, I don't know, right? So that means I need to reposition myself. I need to stay away from, from the community, okay? To stay apart, one meter apart, or to stay indoors to protect my body and not to affect another body, okay? So that means I'm playing my role as a, as a, as a person at a micro level, as a sick person at a micro level, and a sick person at a macro level. So that is how, uh, how we go about understanding the, uh, the human body. I think, uh, uh, I think uh, with that note, I think with this, I think I have no more, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, okay. Uh, in this case, uh, again, I already mentioned uh, that makes us, uh, medical anthropology is a, is a discipline that emphasizes on bioculturalism. Okay, uh, so for my conclusion, I could say that uh, medical anthropology, which I understand now, is uh, emphasizing more to bioculturalism approach that refers to the significant interactions between biology and culture. Culture teaches us how to think about experience and how to respond to the sensation of pain at the same time in assessing or evaluating a disease in a more, in, in, a, in a cultural way. Okay, it is important to consider how biology and culture interact. Cultural practices, on, on the other hand, may inhibit or promote disease spread. And conversely, disease and can significantly promote culture. Okay, I think, um, uh, I think that's all I think I could say from my presentation today. Uh, these are the references that I use for my, for my presentation today. So uh, uh, articles from Fabrica, Andy Cole, Kleinman, Lederman, Michael Palace, Rivers, and Singer. So these are all these are the references that I use. Uh, so you want to know more about the, uh, the details of, of this, you can read from all these reading materials given, inshallah. I think with that note, Dr. Junaidi, uh, thank you very much. If there are any questions, you're most welcome. Uh, thank you. That's it. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And I would like to, take, to, to thank again uh, Umpat University, University Pajajara Bandung for giving me this a great opportunity to share some, some of the knowledge that I have about medical system as a cultural system. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Madia Dr. Azlan. <clears throat> I think there's a many question, yeah? many questions uh, they can be asked uh, in this forum <clears throat> and become the key question the, is the, uh, in the today public lecture. Please, if you have any question, we welcome. Please. Okay. <laughs> no, yeah. I asked to the prophet, to the participant to ask a question, yeah, <clears throat> uh, to, uh, to Professor Madia, Dr. Aslan. The fundamental question of the health, uh, health uh, anthropology and the uh, uh, in holistic, yeah, holistic uh, nature of the health anthropology, the few or the many aspects, the son, including uh, the aspect, the social, culture, uh, implement on the aspect uh, relate, uh, rel related of religion. Uh, how to the see uh, the aspect of the especially, uh, if it the contradiction of the about aspect, especially of religion in element, Prof. Dr. Madia, uh, Prof. Azlan. <clears throat> The contradiction of the religion. <clears throat> again, again, I, 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 I try to understand the question again. Can you repeat the question yes. again? Uh, about this, the fundamental of the, about especially the, uh, the contradiction of the aspect uh, religion element about the local wisdom and the others. I think oh, it's you're talking about kerajaan, kerajaan Malaysia uh, about the uh, Islamic, yeah, Islamic. Uh, in the, in the, in the, I mean, you mean the, in the context of uh, medical system or what? Oh, yeah, you think how the yeah, government responds to the yeah. to the to the available to the medical system now, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, we are talking about uh, interestingly uh, when we talk uh -huh. about medical system, when we talk about medical system in the context of Malaysia, uh, you need to understand uh, several issues involved. One is uh, the modern medical system. Okay, that is very clear. Okay, and uh, most of the medical system will subscribe more to the uh, scientific kind of reasoning. Okay, fine. The second medical system, the so-called the traditional system, 
where the, the, the premise uh, will be very much more to the council beliefs. These are the, the, the role played by the Padukun and the Bomo and the Testihila. And, and it, it covers like Orang Asti, Malay medicine, whatever, traditional Malay medicine. That is number two. The third category medical system, but we don't call them Padukun. These are the Ustaz. Okay. Uh, and this will start actually using the Rukyah method, using verses from the Quran. And they are not subscribing to scientific premise. And they are not, they are not also uh, subscribed to the, the traditional premise. To them, they believe their medical system is uh, based on Islam, based on religion. So if uh, anybody got sick, if you go to modern medicine, okay, that's fine. But when you go to um, traditional medicine, which emphasizes more on the cultural beliefs, and, and again, the Sharia, and then the Ustaz will say, it is not right. Okay, uh, But, but uh, for the Ustaz, they say that uh, if you have other things that, uh, to be, let's say, if you are suffering from some kind of uh, illness or disease due to supernatural forces, you come and see us because we are more Sharia compliance. But the point that is in terms of uh, on the theoretical perspective, but in reality, in reality, patients, they are, most of the patients, they are, they are not really care very much about this because what is more important for the patient is to search for a cure. Okay? Because they have an, for the patient, they have another kind of, uh, another kind of reasoning. They, 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 they rationalize it in a way that, well, it's, it's an effort, regardless whether you go to modern medicine, whether you go to traditional medicine, whether to go to, yeah, it's all these are efforts. Okay, I don't really believe uh, what, is, <coughs> what is mentioned by the BOMO. I don't believe, but I just want my disease to be treated and cured. That is, regardless, whichever. So the government so far, based on your uh, question just now, even so far in Malaysia, we have all these three. So Malaysian government never issue any, any letter or any law to prohibit the non-Sharia uh, medical system to be practiced. So, okay, it's up to you. It's up to the patient. Okay, and even now you can see uh, nowadays uh, we have another NG, we have these companies, right? Not the medical system. We have these um, entrepreneurs selling um, supplements. Uh, different types of juices, right? Uh, so the government say, okay, uh, you can use all the herbs, herbal, remed herbal remedies and so on, but you need to register your herbal remedies with our Ministry of Health. Uh, you need to allow our, our committee to look into what are the ingredients that you have in your, in your herbal remedies. So all the herbal concussions must be registered. So once the, uh, the herbal remedies got registration, got the, the number, and approved by the uh, Ministry of Health. So that would be a, a breakthrough uh, for, for the entrepreneur to sell his or her product. As of now, not many, right? Uh, maybe some, okay? Okay, thank you, Dr. Junadi, for the question. Thank you, thank you, uh, Professor Madi and Dr. Azlan. Yeah, I, I, one question in the uh, chat room, yeah, from Alpiranda Pratama, yeah? Permission okay. to ask what? are the form of the traditional medicine in Malaysia in the tra treating COVID-19 in there some kind of ritual uh, performance uh, in, in Malaysia in order to treat uh, COVID-19? The prof. One. Okay, I think as far as COVID-19 is concerned, uh, uh, I don't see any... Uh, of course, we have many traditional healers offering their, their skills to, to treat COVID-19. But uh, I think what happens in Malaysia, uh, if you look at the, uh, if you look at my, my slide, let's see, let me go down. Okay. If you look at, uh, okay, hang on. Please bear with me. Okay, if you look at this uh, healthcare system, most of the, uh, for the COVID-19, I think it is more, common in the popular sector. So, and uh, word spread through by mouth. Let's say uh, for COVID-19, we, we should use this, we should, 
we should use this and that. But there's no clear, clear or uh, clear evidence of any traditional treatment that can resolve COVID-19. So I think uh, yeah, the only that we observe in the context of Malaysia, we only have two groups. One, they will go for vaccination. They believe the, uh, the vaccination can give uh, a relief uh, for the COVID-19. But there's another group, the so-called anti-vaccination group. So this group, neither nor. They don't, they don't get vaccination. They don't get themselves vaccinated. At the same time, they don't go even for any kinds of, or any, any, any alternative medication. So they just uh, read all and they believe it's came from Allah and that's it. Uh, and maybe they have some popular beliefs, uh, which is not really, uh, well, is not really well accepted and it is not widespread. Uh, so COVID-19, as of now, I think uh, modern medicines are, are more prevalent or more evident in dealing with the COVID-19, not the traditional medicine. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, I think it's, uh, our time is over. <laughs> uh, it's over. Uh, uh, if you there are no questions, I will uh, uh, end today a lecture <clears throat> uh, for the health, uh, health anthropology coach uh, next week. The lecture will still be delivered by Professor Madia, Dr. Azlan. <clears throat> Uh, and then uh, thank you, yeah, thank you very much for uh, Professor Dr. Madi Ajlan and the Miss, uh, Mr. and Mrs. and the all students. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to all, thank you to uh, to our students and also the committee and umpat. Yeah, good health always for, uh, ma, uh, yeah. for from Prof. Madia Dr. Ajlan. Thank you very much. Alhamdulillah, inshallah. By the way, how to how how to how to live? Huh? I don't know how to. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, bro. Bagaimana? Bagaimana nak keluar ni? Eh? It's over. Uh, the Pak Ujang. Pak Ujang is the host. Pak Ujang. Hmm. Bagaimana ni? Yes. So, uh, and stop. Yeah. Thank you, bro. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh yeah. Okay. 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 Terima kasih. Jumpa lagi. Ya, thank you, bro. Thank you, bro. Mak, bro. Ya, Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam. Warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat raya. Selamat raya. <laughs> Inal Aydin wal Faidin, bro.